Well, good morning. morning. Welcome to chapel. It's great to be here in the house of the Lord. I hope that you had a great extended weekend. How many likes having Monday as a break? Amen. 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 Hopefully you got caught up on some deadlines, some homework, and uh, the such. Uh, It is a privilege today to welcome to chapel uh, Brother Mark Keith, who is the Associational Mission Strategist, AMS or DOM as they sometimes are called, uh, for the Knox Association of Baptists, where myself, Brother Michael DeLand, Brother Taylor, Brother Jared Stiles all serve in ministry at local churches there. And so we have the privilege of serving uh, our community and, and the churches of Knox County uh, together. And so uh, he, he and his family have been longtime friends, partners of Clear Creek. Uh, as a matter of fact, there are Keith Apartments on our campus that they have uh, helped to provide for us. And so we're grateful for that. And uh, looking forward to hearing Brother Mark preach today. And I hope and pray that you're blessed by it. Uh, I do want to remind you that we're in that season of missions giving. Uh, We have Eliza Brada's state missions offering that we are collecting, and so if you could reach uh, into the depths and crevices of your savings account, pull out a crusty $10 bill, throw it in the envelope, and pass it God's way, uh, it's amazing what God can do with it. Amen? Uh, You sounded more like, oh, me. (laughs) God can do amazing things with it, and he'll reach countless souls. Uh, for Christ. With Brother Mark today, we do have a guest as well, his cousin, John Dodd. He's a retired uh, military vet, and so give him a Clear Creek welcome. <clears throat> and, and Brother Taylor, he said if we had an online program, he might be interested in uh, signing up. We said, well, good news. We do. And uh, so there you go. There, there's a recruit, all right? So he lives up in Harlem County, up in Benham, and we're thankful he's here today as well. Unspoken prayer request. Amen. Let's pray and then let's worship. Heavenly Father, we love you, Lord God. We're so thankful for you, for your presence in our life. We thank you for this place, or for every man and woman of God that you brought to this campus, for the calling that we share. Father, we pray for the anointing of your Holy Spirit to just be upon the singers, the musicians today. Lord, just be upon our worship, be upon the man of God who comes to preach the word of God. May you loose his lips, position your gifting within him that we could hear from heaven, that it would move our heart. I pray that you'd lift every burden that folks are carrying today. I pray you'd meet every need of our lives. Father, we know that you are Jehovah Rapha, the God who heals, Jehovah Jireh, the Lord who provides. And Father, we'll not praise, uh, fail to praise and thank you, Father, for all that you have done and all that you continue to do. And we pray and ask this today in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, Clear Creek, it's great to be back with you after a break. Um, But uh, we have work to do in the name of the Lord, and that shouldn't dissuade us, that should encourage us. Amen. Amen. So let's stand together and worship our Savior this morning.
grandfather's funeral just last week when he told me he wanted me to boldly declare what he believed in and who he believed in. So this morning, join me in singing not only with the saints that have gone before, but with our Savior Jesus Christ. Through your 
Spirit, whether sitting, standing, or coming to this altar. But this morning, I know there are many that are hurting, that are sick, that are broken in this room. But know that our Savior is so sweet to trust in Him. And we're about to sing that in just a moment. So right now, be led by the Holy Spirit.
this morning. We pray you heard the singing of your saints this morning. Not for our glory, but for yours, God. Lord, that we truly believe in the depths of our soul that we can trust you. No matter how bleak the times may seem, no matter what waves may be crashing around us, let us be like those that walk on the water fixed on you, Lord, not at the waves around us, so that we may never slip or fall. And God, as we enter into this time of worship through your word, God, bring your word fresh upon us, God. And help us trust and know that it is surely from you. In Jesus' precious and heavenly name we pray this. Amen. 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 <laughs> well, amen. It's good to be with you today. I count it a privilege and an honor to be speaking to you in chapel. I have uh, known a lot of Clear Creek graduates. Uh, I feel very close to Clear Creek, and I have known down through the years many of your graduates here. If I named them, some of you may recognize them, some of you may not. But uh, this school produces uh, solid, godly, biblical preachers. And uh, I can always rely and trust on Clear Creek. If I get a resume that says they've graduated from Clear Creek, I usually know they're pretty good and they're all right. But it is good to be with you and... You know, uh, when you become a director of missions, it means that they figured out you can't preach anymore. <laughs> so, 
we used to laugh and tease that uh, when you couldn't do anything else, they made a director of missions out of you. But I'm enjoying it. I'm enjoying it. And uh, as we sang those songs, one thing I began to realize, uh, this month I will turn 68. I don't feel 68. But I'm learning along the way that Jesus is a bigger Savior than I ever thought possible. And I'm a greater sinner than I ever realized. And I realized the other day a situation arose in my life, and I thought, you know what? If, if you took Jesus out of my life, I would be just like I was as a 19-year-old boy and would respond the same way, probably with anger and all kinds of stuff. And I thought, Lord Jesus, what a great thing it is to have you in my life. And, and I thought uh, the people I was mad at, I thought they better be glad that you're in my life too. <laughs> so, but anyhow. Well, turn with me this morning in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 14 and verses 22 through 33. You know, March is known as the windy month. It comes in like a, like a lamb and, and goes out like a lion, or maybe that's backwards. Maybe it comes in like a lion and goes out like a lamb. But I was reading not long ago that uh, the winds of, of, of March are used by God to bend and flex the trees that begin to get the sap to moving in the spring for them to be fruitful and to do what God intended them to be. And it hit me, you know, many times God brings adversity into our life and we look on upon, upon it as a horrible, awful thing, but many times adversity is some of the greatest growth experiences that you'll ever go through. And uh, as a rule, God is always asking His people to step out of their comfort zone. I hadn't been saved too long till I began to realize that Christianity is not a comfortable religion. God does not want you to be comfortable. He will not allow you to remain comfortable. And I think about the time that he asked Abraham to go up and offer his son Isaac on Mount Moriah. There was a time he asked Moses to lead Israel across the Red Sea. And there was that time that he asked Joshua to simply walk around the city of Jericho and just to shout when he told him to. Well, in the, in the verses that we're going to look at, Peter is getting ready to get out of the boat and walk on the water. And for me, I think that ranks in the top ten of, in the Bible of being challenged out of your comfort zone. And the amazing thing is, uh, where, not where he was, but who he was with and what he was willing uh, to do. Peter's attempt, I think, to walk on water uh, was, was one of the most tremendous situations that ever could have presented itself. And you know, I have found out that the ones that God uses will always face certain elements. There will always be a call. God asks you, an ordinary person, to move out of your comfort zone and to get out of the boat. There is always fear. You know, God is in the habit of of asking you to do something that may scare you at first. Sometimes he asks you to do things that cause fear in your life. Then there's always the reassurance. God always promises his strength. And there's always a decision. You have to make up your mind, am I going to follow God, let him take care of my fears, or am I going to stay where I'm at? Let me share something with you. When God calls you to something, you cannot stay where you are and go with God. You just cannot remain there. And then there's always a changed life. If you choose to obey God, your life is going to be enriched beyond your wildest understanding. And if you choose to disobey, your life is also going to change. You're going to become cold and hardened toward the things of God. I've entitled this message, If You Want to Walk on Water, You've Got to Get Out of the Boat. And I'm going to begin reading in Matthew chapter 14, verse 22. And straightway Jesus constrained his disciples to get into a ship and to go before him to the other side. While he sent the multitudes away, and when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up into a mountain apart to pray. And when the evening was come, he was there alone. But the ship was now in the midst of the sea, tossed with waves, for the wind was contrary. And in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went unto them walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a spirit And they cried out for fear. But straightway Jesus spake unto them, saying, Be of good cheer, it is I, be not afraid. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it be thou, bid me to come unto thee on the water. And he said, Come. And when Peter was come down out of the ship, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid, and beginning to sink, he cried, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand and called him and said unto him, 
O thou of little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? And they, and they were coming to the ship, the wind ceased. Let's go to the Lord in prayer at this time. Father, I thank you so much. Lord, did you show us how your disciples were so human? They were so like us. Sometimes they were filled with courage and sometimes they were filled with fear. Lord, I know that as we stand here today that there's many things that will make us afraid today. If we watch the news and see the world politics and see our national politics and the, and the spiritual climate of our nation, Lord, many times it strikes fear in our hearts. But we need to be reminded that the same Jesus who comes walking on the water can come and speak to our hearts in times of trouble, Lord. I pray for these students, Lord. I know that life as a student isn't easy. Sometimes it's very challenging. And I pray, Lord, that you would encourage your called out today. And I ask that in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, you got to get out of the boat. You're either going to be a boat potato or a bold believer. You know, Jesus has just fed the 5,000. And uh, it's estimated that there was probably about 25,000 people there. Uh, it just counted kind of men there that day. But there was about 25,000 people. And it kind of brought back remembrances to Israel about having manna in the wilderness. It kind of brought back about Elijah feeding them. And it kind of brought back, and, and you know, the, the Old Testament even prophesied that one greater than Moses and Elijah would come. And so here they had proof. Uh, Jesus was proving himself to them. And uh, they were so overwhelmed with what was going on, they were going to take Jesus and crown him king. You know, his disciples got caught up in that as well. I can see them going, yeah, yeah, it's time for Jesus to accept the kingdom. And uh, so they, they got right into that, and Jesus knew that he had to defuse the situation. So he said, look, I want you to get in this boat, and I want you to meet me on the other side. And then Jesus was going to go up into the mountaintop to pray. And I can see the disciples, you know, they're sitting there thinking, Lord, we don't understand what's going on. You see, they had just come back from a very successful mission trip where he had sent them out two by two, and they came back, <clears throat> excuse me, rejoicing, Lord, even the demons were subject to us under your name. And they, they were here thinking now, okay, the time is right. Jesus will set up the kingdom. We're going to crown him king. That means that we're part of the government here. And they were ready for that to happen. And Jesus said, no, 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 no. That's not what I came for. I didn't come to be a, a, political, a political king. And so he tells the disciples, I'm sending you on. Will they get in the boat? Can you, can you hear them talking among themselves? What's going on? Why did Jesus do that? This is a popular moment. This is the moment to, to, to seize while the iron is hot and, and, and to bring the kingdom in. But they get in the boat. And I want you to know that in the meantime, it is a mean time for the disciples. Let me tell you what, God is sometimes beyond our understanding. I, I have just about quit trying to figure God out. I just bow to Him and to say, Lord, I, I bow my IBM, that's my itty-bitty mind, to Your divine reasoning. Lord, there's many things that I don't understand. Dr. James Dobson wrote a book one time, When God Doesn't Make Sense. And I'm going to be honest with you, if you live long enough and walk close enough to the Lord, there will be times that He does not make sense. You see, we would like to have a telegram from God giving us an outline for the next 20, 30 years of our life. God does not do that. God gives you enough light to take the next step and the next step and the next step, and on we go, and it's called faith. So sometimes God does not make sense. The disciples were confused about what was going on. Jesus had not met their expectations. You know, there are some times that Jesus does not meet our expectations. Let me tell you why. Because we have false expectations. That's what it is. Sometimes we have, we have accepted things along with true doctrine that kind of kind of acts like, well, God exists for my, for my happiness. Let me tell you something. You need to forget that right now. God exists for your holiness, not necessarily your happiness. But now, God is not against you being happy. I will be the first to tell you that. You know, one of the things that I found out is that you can be right in the middle of God's will and not be happy about it. You ever thought about that? Sometimes you can be as obedient as you know how to be, and you're in a situation where you're being obedient, you're doing the best that you know how to do, you're, you're living up to the light that God has showed you, and you're not happy about it. I remember my first semester of seminary. I knew I was exactly where God wanted me to be, but when it got to be really hard and really a struggle, uh, I, I began to think, Lord, are you sure this is what you want? Lord, you know I'm not a mental heavyweight. Lord, you know I'm not an academician. Lord, are you sure? 
And he was. I remember I quit so many times, my wife quit listening to me. <laughs> and I remember one time the Lord saying, the only way you get out of here is with a degree. So I buckled down and I did it. So I know what you're going through as students. I know what you're going through as students and, and the study and all the discipline and all that goes with that. The 12 had, had come back from a victorious mission trip and, and they were ready for the kingdom and their expectations were shattered. Instead of weapons, they got oars. You know, they were thought, okay, get your weapons, get your, get your side gear, let's go. We're going we're to go storm the palace of Herod. And they're probably thinking, what kind of a Messiah is this? You know, let me tell you what, they, they were really wondering about Jesus. Look at, the, look at the sequence. Jesus sends the disciples to cross the Sea of Galilee. He then dismisses the crowd. He goes alone to the mountain to pray. <coughs> Excuse me. And probably around 6 p.m., the storm struck, and when it struck, it was quick. Now, some of you have journeyed to Israel. You've seen the Holy Land. You've seen the Jordan. You've seen the Sea of Galilee. You know that to the north is Mount Hermon, and the melted snow waters off Mount Hermon form the headwaters of the Jordan River. Well, it flows into the Jordan, but then it also flows down into the Dead Sea, which is no outlet, and in, in the uh, Dead Sea area... The summer temperatures can get to 120 degrees, so you don't have to be a real weatherman to know that when a cold front meets a warm front, you have a storm taking place. <coughs> and there was a doozy <coughs> that was taking place. There was a doozy going on, but I tell you what, it wasn't nothing compared to the storm that was going on in the disciples' heart. You see, Jesus purposely sent the disciples to face the storm alone. Jesus purposely did that. He knew what was going to happen. Do you think that COVID has caught Jesus unaware? Do you think that what we're dealing with today, the, 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 the fall of Afghanistan and all this, not that he planned it, but, but I'm, do you think it has caught our God unaware and, and not knowing what's going on? Let me tell you something. The Trinity never meets an emergency session because there's never an emergency with God. And so Jesus knew that they were going to be alone, <clears throat> and he knew that this storm was going to carpet bomb every inch of the Sea of Galilee, but it was his full intent that the disciples face it alone. I just finished reading an interesting story about a man that was on a moose hunt in Alaska, and he was a believer. He got mauled by a grizzly bear, and the grizzly bear just about killed him. But before the grizzly bear attacked him, he shot him right full in the jaw. And I'm kind of condensing the story real quick here. When he came to, after being severely mauled and beat up and banged up and almost dying, he came to in the, in the operating room in intensive care, and he began to get angry with the Lord. He said the Lord was really close to me during that, during that experience in the intensive care, and he began to get angry with the Lord. He said, where were you? You could have averted this thing. You could have stopped this thing. Where were you when I was being eaten up alive by that grizzly bear? And he said, the Lord told him, he said, go back. He said, I was with you when you hand-loaded that 300 Winchester Magnum caliber. I was with you when you shot that bear full in the face. I guided that bullet. He found out later from one of the game officials, had he not have broken the jaw, of that grizzly bear, it would have crushed his head like a peanut. He could not get the full force of his jaws wrapped around him. He lived because Jesus guided a bullet that broke the jaw of a grizzly bear. He said, I was there. So let me tell you what, sometimes the things that we go through seem to be very bad, but always know this, if you're a child of God, the hand of God is with you wherever you go. And the watch care of God is with you wherever you go. And so these disciples were really having a hard time. The, the biggest storm that was going on was the storm in their heart. And these, for the most part, were experienced fishermen. These were guys, many of them, that fished for a living. I'm sure they'd been on the Sea of Galilee when storms had struck. But let me tell you what, when the sailors are scared, you better be scared too. My father was in the Navy during World War II. He was on a, he was on a small vessel. He said they rode out a typhoon. And he said it literally felt like the ship would go up like a roller coaster come down and scrape the bottom of the ocean. He said there were experienced sailors on that ship who claimed to be unbelievers were crying out to God. 
And he said they were throwing up. And experienced sailors were scared out of their mind what was going on during that typhoon. I would say my father was one of them. <laughs> These guys were scared. And I can hear them, at least in their minds, where's Jesus? Man, he just fed all these people. They're strangers. We've been with him all these years. We've been with him from the beginning of his ministry. And where is he? And so it gets to be about, about 11 o'clock and then 1 o'clock and there is no Jesus. And man, they're, they're just taking a real pounding here. And then it gets to be 2 o'clock and there is no Jesus. And somewhere between 3 and 6 o'clock in the morning, here comes Jesus walking on the water. Now the disciples, the Bible says they thought it was a shadow coming. They thought it was a spirit. You know, as I'm thinking about this, I'm thinking, who else could it be but Jesus? Nobody else can walk on water. But they were like us. They were scared to death. Let me tell you what, I really believe that if God made himself known to us in some ways, it would scare us out of our mind. It would literally terrify us. So Jesus comes. The disciples thought he was a ghost. They were terrified and they cried out for fear. How could they have failed to know it was Jesus. Who else would it be? Matthew wants us to know that it takes the eye of faith to recognize when Jesus is around. There are things that happen around us that if we don't have the eyes of faith, we're going to miss. I'll tell you one in particular. Back when Kentucky had a partnership with Kenya, my younger life, I had prayed, Lord, I want to live to see a mighty, sweeping revival like I've read about, the Great Awakenings and the first and the second and, 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 the, and the Wales Revival. God, I want to experience something like that. And I got to go with the team, and they called it the Swahili Pentecost, what was going on in Kenya at that time. Oh, they were baptizing hundreds and thousands, and new churches were springing up. And we were sitting around having dinner one day, and the Lord spoke to my heart. And he said, you remember that prayer you prayed? By the way, God remembers every prayer you ever prayed. He said, do you remember that prayer you prayed about 10 or 15 years ago? I said, yeah. He said, open your eyes. It's happening right before your eyes. You see, I could have missed that. I could have come home and said, well, we had a marvelous meeting, but God reminded me, I gave you what you asked for. And man, that meant so much to me to know that God said, open your eyes and see what I'm doing. Well, what was Jesus up to walking on the sea at 3 o'clock in the morning? In the Gospel of Mark, it says that Jesus intended to pass them by. That's almost humorous, isn't it? It's kind of like he would have kept walking if they hadn't said, Hey, hey, we need help here. I think Jesus has a sense of humor, don't you? You know, uh, they, they call it a theophany. That is a defining moment when God appears strikingly and, and temporarily on earth to a select group of individuals for the purpose of, uh, of presenting them a message. He appeared to Moses in the burning bush to get his attention. He comes walking on the water to get the attention of his disciples. In each situation, that person that God calls, he asks them to do something extraordinary. And in each situation, that person feels afraid. Many of you, when you were struggling with the call to ministry, I'm sure there was a fear factor there. I'm sure there was some, uh, some, some things you really had to work out. And especially if uh, you were married, there's some things your wife probably had to work out when you accepted the call to preach. And, and so sometimes God does not give us a comfortable time. But Jesus coming to them on the water, intending to pass them by, was not just a magic trick. He was revealing His divine presence and power. He was doing something that only God can do. And the disciples got into the boat out of obedience, and they faced a hard time. And I want you to know something. Sometimes you can be doing exactly what God wants you to do, and you can be having a hard time. We tend to think that if we're obedient, it's all going to be easy. No, it's not. Sometimes it's going to get harder. But Jesus, Jesus often comes when we least expect him at 3 o'clock in the midst of life's storms. You see, we need to know that man's extremity is but God's opportunity. And God sometimes comes to us and asks us to follow in a way we haven't totally figured it out yet. And if you're not looking for him, you're going to miss what he's doing. You're going to miss it. Twelve disciples huddled in a boat. They're tired. They're wet. They're afraid. But one of them is about to become a water walker. Peter recognizes that God is present. He recognizes that Jesus is present, that, Jesus, that God in Christ is present. 
And he recognized here's an extraordinary opportunity. <clears throat> Sometimes we need to look at our hardships as opportunities and, and things that we can benefit from. And Peter blurts out, Lord, if it's you, command me to come to you. Command me. Why didn't Peter just jump in? You know, I can see Peter just jumping in saying, Lord, here I come. But he said, Lord, if it's you, command me to come. You see, this isn't about risk-taking. It's about obedience. And we need to discern between an authentic call from God and, God and what might be just a foolishness that we're getting ready to do. Sometimes we're filled with foolishness. Sometimes our zeal is without knowledge. I tell people when God first called me to preach, I was ignorance on fire. Now I'm just ignorant because the fire's gone. <laughs> Oh, I love young preachers, though. They're fun to be with. I want you to know that Jesus isn't looking for bungee jumping, hang gliding, thrill seekers. Walking on water is not a recreational sport. It's not about extreme sports. It's about extreme discipleship. <clears throat> and that's why before Peter gets out of the boat, he says, Lord, can I come? And Peter asks for clarity. If it's you, command me to come. I hope in heaven that we get some instant replays on some of these great things that transpired. I want to see the flood. I want to see the, the account when Noah was safe in the ark, and I want to see all of that fury of the flood. I want to see that. I hope we get to see this on instant replay because I believe if we do, and I'm using my sanctified imagination now, I believe that there may have been a little grin on Jesus' face when he said, Come. Come on. You want to come? Come. Peter had enough faith to make him want to be part of the adventure. What about you? Do you have any idea what God is doing? Do you have any desire to be a part of it? So many times we read the biblical accounts and we fail to put ourselves in that person's place and we lose a lot by not doing that. Think about Abraham when God said, I want you to take your son up there on Mount Moriah and I want you to sacrifice him. You know what I would have done? I would have went and said, Sarah, honey, did you put peyote in my oatmeal this morning? Sarah, what did you, did you put something in the food today that's made me crazy? Put yourself in Abraham's place. This was the child of promise. He wasn't going to get another one like this. And God said, take him out and sacrifice. I would have been thinking now, God, I just don't think I heard you right. We don't know the struggle Abraham went through, but the Bible tells us that Abraham believed to the point where he thought God would raise him from the dead if necessary. Now that's faith, brother. That is faith. Let's imagine for a moment you're Peter. <clears throat> you see Jesus passing by. He invites you to do the humanly impossible. And, and to be honest, you're scared to death. <clears throat> what would you choose, the water or the security of the boat? You see, the boat is safety. It's security. It's, it's comforting. But the water is rough. The wind is terrible. If you get out of the boat, you might sink. If you don't get out of the boat you'll never walk on water either. There's a law here. If you want to walk on water, you have to get out of the boat. You know, I think that deep down within each one of us, there isn't a desire to have an adventure with God in our walk with Him in this life. I don't believe that God meant for the Christian life to be dull, dead, and boring. Have you ever had a boring moment in the presence of Jesus? I've had boring moments under the presence of some preaching I've heard. I've had boring moments in church. Sometimes I've had a hard time keeping my eyes open. You know, I remember one Sunday asking my wife, give me good, one good reason we need to go to church today. She said, you're the pastor. I said, okay. <laughs> but I can honestly tell you, when I have experienced the presence of God, it has never been boring. It has always been the most alive I have ever been in that moment. And it makes me know what heaven's going to be like. But we, we desire that bold encounter. You know, there is something that makes us want to leave our comfort zone. So what is your boat? Your boat is whatever represents your security that you're afraid to let go of. It is whatever you put your trust in. It is whatever you keep from boldly joining Jesus on the waves. I talked to an old-time pastor one time, Brother S.R. Helton. You may have known him or may have heard of him. He pastored uh, Riverside. He pastored all over up here. And he told me when I first went to preaching, he said, you know, God called him about midlife. He ran a store somewhere around here, and I forget what the store was. 
But he said he thought, well, I, I can keep on uh, running this store and, and I can preach on the side. And he said, you know, I never had any peace whatsoever until I locked that store for the last time and walked away from it and went full time with the Lord. He said, I never had any peace. And I thought, you know what? His security, his boat was that store. And the Lord was just, I don't think the Lord minded him keeping the store, but he wanted him to know that you need to trust me, not your store. You need to trust me to take care of you. If you want to know what your boat is, it's whatever your fear tells you. What areas in your life are you shrinking back from fully trusting God with? Fear reveals your boat. And leaving it may be the biggest crisis in your life. But you're either a boat potato or a bold believer. You, you might be a water walker if you expect problems. Let me tell you what. I, I knew of a guy one time who had a sermon entitled, Receive the Holy Ghost and Trouble. You get spirit-filled and you're going to have trouble. I want you to know. You know why? Satan hates a spirit-filled believer. And he's going to come after you. Well, then reality sets in. Peter is standing there and I think he's probably thinking, man, I'm standing up on the water. And then all of a sudden he hears the wind and he looks around and he sees the waves. You know what? They were always there. He just took his eyes off Jesus and he began to sink. And he cried out, oh, Lord, save me. Oh, Lord, save me. You know, I like this story because it tells me that I may fail in my service to Jesus. I may fail in some of my endeavors. I'm not going to purposely go off on a false start somewhere. But I don't want to live my life in fear of what may have been. And I know that if I fall, Jesus will catch me. When I was in my early 50s, I had just finished reading the book, The Prayer of Jabez, and I prayed that prayer. I prayed that prayer, and immediately I got a phone call to come to Utah and Idaho to be their, uh, their uh, evangelism director. And you know what I said? I can't come. <laughs> I can't come. My mother was sick at the time, and I was the only child close to my father, but long story short, my mother died six months later. I called him, and I ended up going out there. And one reason I went, I really didn't want to go. But one reason I went, and I told my wife, I said, I don't want to be looking over my shoulder the rest of my life wondering what God would have done with me out there. I don't want to be looking over my shoulder thinking what may have been. And I remember telling the Lord, I want to stay where I'm at in the pastor. And the Lord said, you want to stay where I don't want you? You're really fixing for trouble. You know, you think the pastor, it's hard right now. You try doing it without my blessing. And you're going to find out how hard it is. So I went and had a good time. You might be a water walker if you accept fear as the price tag of growth. I want to share with you the truth that if you're going to walk on water, the fear is not going to go away. Do you know what the best-selling chair in America is? Lazy boy. It's not risky boy. It's not worker boy. It's lazy boy. You know why? We want to be comfortable. We want to be comfortable. We want to be couch potatoes. You know, you could call the other 11 disciples boat potatoes. We have millions of people in our churches today that are pew potatoes. We have millions that don't want to be shaken out of their comfort zone. They want to hear a comfortable sermon. They don't want to be challenged. They want you to get out right on time. They want you to have everything just cut and dried for them. But they don't want to be challenged. You know, some people have already died mentally. They've already died mentally. I think the real failures that day were the other 11. The reason to get out of the boat is that's where Jesus is. When Jesus had come to them at the opportune tide, the height of their fear, he quieted their fear by, fear by saying, Be of good cheer, it is I, be not afraid. Did you know that that it is I is the same literally as I am? You know, I've had Jehovah's Witness say, you know, Jesus never declared himself to be Jehovah God. And I said, oh, yes, he did. You count all the times that he said, I am the truth, I am the light, I am the way. I said that I am is the exact same sentence construction, the exact same meaning as was given to Moses on Mount Sinai when God said, I am Jehovah God, I will meet all of your needs. Jesus was saying, I am Jehovah God wrapped in human flesh. How much plainer can that be? Yes, he did proclaim himself Jehovah God. And he's telling them here, the I am is with you. What are you afraid of? The great I am is with you. 
preacher, all this talk about risk and faith and growth, why do we need to risk getting out of the boat? Well, because Jesus is still looking for bold believers. And it's the only way to real growth. And because it's still the way the true faith develops and because the alternative is boredom and stagnation and because that people are going to wither and die and because of it, if we don't do something, people are going to die and go to hell because we're not being bold. I preached at our state convention, Utah and Idaho. I guess they thought, you're the, you're the evangelism guy. We want to hear evangelism. And I never will forget what one of the pastors said. He said, I want you to tell us why we need to evangelize. I'm going to tell you what, he was reformed. And I found out a lot of them guys reformed. If you're reformed, that's okay. I'm not bashing you to be that way at all. I'm not. And I have reformed that I love. But I thought, you know, no wonder we're not. No wonder we're not reaching people. If you preachers really have to be told why we need to do it. So I preached a sermon on the Great Commission. And I preached it pretty stout. And I closed by saying, I was asked to tell you why we need to evangelize. I looked around and I said, here it comes. Are you ready for this? Get your pens ready. Because Jesus said to do it. That's exactly why we do it. By the way, I know some Reformed people that are very evangelistic, by the way. They're very, they're very evangelistic in their approach. But it kind of floored me. Why do I have to tell a Baptist body why we need to do evangelism? You know, I have found out that every time I have followed God, He has rewarded me with... Every time I've found out that I've been obedient, He has rewarded me. He has blessed me. Lastly, walking on water can be risky. We tend to create a world for ourselves. We try to manage our lives with, with uh, secure, predictable way, and, and here, here's the illusion we have, I'm in control. Guess what? You're not in control of anything. You're not in control of the weather. You're not in control. If you're married, you're definitely not in control of your wife. I mean, she may be obedient to what you say, but you, you cannot make her do what she does not want to do. Man, I, you know, there's some things I wish I could control. The Wildcats would have won the national championship last year. I would have controlled that. You know, I would have controlled the many things, but listen, you need to realize that you are not in control of anything except the way you react to something. And that's all you're in control of. By the way, we like to think we're in control, don't we? Well, two things are certain. If you dare to get out of the boat, you'll either walk on the water or you'll sink. And if you sink, you'll sink into the arms of Jesus. You'll fall into his arms. You remember the parable that Jesus gave? That he gave so many talents. He gave one five talents, one two talents. I'm not sure if I'm getting it all right or not. And one he gave one. And he came back, had a day of reckoning. And the other two that he had given several talents to, they said, Lord, look, we've taken what you've given us. We've invested it. And we've got more. And he came to the one and said, what about you? He said, Lord, I knew what a hard man you were. And I buried it in the ground. You remember what Jesus said? You know what? If you just put it in the bank and draw the interest on it, I'd have been happier with you. And you know the thing that strikes me? The guy said, I knew what a hard man you were. In other words, I knew what an evil master you are. I know that you wouldn't bless me. How many seem to think that God does not want to bless them? Let me tell you what. If God called you, He wants to bless you. If God called you to do this, He wants to bless you. And you remember what He said? Take it away from me. <clears throat> Take it away from me. When I stand before Jesus, I want to hear, well done, good and faithful servant. And if I can't hear that, here's what I want to hear. I want the Lord to turn and look at everybody in heaven and say, well, he wasn't the sharpest pencil in the box, but he tried. <laughs> he tried. You remember that guy on national television that his coach told him on, uh, on the NFL? make something happen, he run off the bench and made a tackle. You remember that? I mean, that goes down as the alt It's almost like the Leitner shot in that Kentucky game. Guy ran off the bench, and they said, why did you do that? They said, the coach said, make something happen. He wasn't even in the game. But I like that old boy, don't you? I like that old boy. It won't be whether you failed. It'll be that you didn't even try. I would rather try and fail than not try at all. You see, here's the bottom line. You can't stay where you are 
and follow God. When God begins to deal, you either have to follow him or you have to rebel. Doesn't mean you lose your salvation, but it means you lose your fellowship. It really does. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for your word and thank you for the just showing us a real picture of your disciples, that they were men like us. And Lord, you took that bunch of men, and even though they were weak, and even though that they had a lot of problems and frailties, Lord, you literally used these men to shake the world for your kingdom. And I thank you, Lord. Father, we're like your disciples. Use us any way you see fit in Jesus' name. Amen.